Thank you. Um, so as Deb said, thanks for having me back again. I love speaking here. I love speaking in general. Um, uh, even though it is a scary thing, as anything that is worthwhile in my opinion. So I guess that's a good thing. Um, so I'm a landscape photographer. I live about an hour north in a town called Beacon in the beautiful Hudson Valley. That's where I do a lot of my landscape work in addition to other areas around uh, the country. But um, that's really where I, what I call home. Um, I'm also passionate about conservation. So I do a lot of conservation work in the Hudson Valley with some local organizations like Scenic Hudson, Autobahn, uh, Nature Conservancy. Um, so that's really exciting when you can do stuff like that and actually see the effects that you can enjoy. Like it's close to home. I can take my kids to these parks that um, are being preserved. So that's a great thing. I sell my work uh, mostly as fine art in galleries uh, on my website, of course. Um, and, uh, and I also love to teach and talk and share what, uh, what I've learned along the way. So those are the different things that um, I, I'm kind of involved in. I'm also writing some books now. I've got one book out um, that uh, this talk today is going gonna, is gonna to draw a lot from. You can download this book for free. On my website, I blog at robertrodriguezjr.com <laughs> forward slash blog. And uh, so you can get this book there. It's free. And I have a, a, an upcoming book on fine art printing, which should be out next week. So uh, that's also a lot of work, but exciting as well. And um, today is Ansel's birthday, of course. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start with uh, one of his pictures because uh, like any landscape photographer, he's had a huge influence on me and my work and my vision, my perspective, my whole outlook in terms of what it is to be a creative person. Uh, and this is one of my favorite pictures of his. This is um, a Glacier National Park. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's fitting that, um, that we can remember everything that he gave. Um, landscape photography is a big subject, a really big subject. There's, there are so many different uh, facets to it. I don't pretend to know them all. I don't even pretend to know the ones that I want to know about. Um, but um, I think it's, it's one of those things that is, I find it really challenging. Uh, but at the same time, that's what pushes me to, find, to try to find uh, solutions to creative problems. Creative problems meaning, you know, how do you express yourself? What do you capture? How do you share that? Uh, what you're thinking about, what you're feeling, etc. So I think that's one of the things that drives me in terms of photography. And so rather than try to teach you specific techniques, which you can find uh, in abundance online, um, I'm going to try to focus really on the things that I think are important, which is some ideas, some concepts, really things that inspire you, that will inspire you to push forward in whatever it is that you're doing. Um, I think that that's really at the heart of anything that's creative. If you're not inspired, then you're not motivated. If you're not motivated, then it's kind of hard to break out of formulas or patterns or similar ways of thinking about things. And anything that's creative always has to be pushing the limits and going into areas that are sort of uh, 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 um, shaky ground, if you will. I'm, I, I'm also going to share a lot of quotes because I love quotes. I think that's a great way to learn about people that have come before us and people that have different ideas. And I think one of the, the best questions that you can ask in landscape photography is the question of why. Uh, why do you shoot what you shoot? Why do you take pictures? Um, what's the purpose? What's your goal? What is it that you want to get out of it? You know, I think th these are really critical questions that can continue to inspire you over time. Um, each person, of course, has a different answer for that. I don't, I, there's no right or wrong answer for that, uh, even though I'd argue that some may be more persuasive than others. But um, that's something that you have to answer really for yourself. And For me, it comes down to number one, because I love spending time in nature. That's pretty, probably the, the first real uh, impetus for me to do what I do. Uh, and the second reason is because um, a quote from Will Rose, which I love, which says, success is not kind of by how you have climbed, but how, by how many people you have brought with you. And not only do I love being in nature, but I also like bringing people with me to nature. And if, if I can't bring them with me physically, it means that I want to try to share what I'm seeing in nature feelings, the emotions, etc. So for me, that's, that's sort of forms the foundation and the basis for everything that I try to do uh, in, in my career. Now, a little bit of a background. Um, I've been shooting 
professionally for about 10 years now as a, as a photographer. Uh, before that, uh, I was a music producer and arranger for about 15 years. Um, and before that, growing up as a kid, I spent my time taking pictures and making music. Uh, and I enjoyed that a hell of a lot more than schoolwork or um, spending time with my friends. Um, so that's sort of my background. How I got from music to photography is um, something I won't, cannot delve into here because it's a long, uh, convoluted story. But at the same time, uh, there, are a lot of there are a lot of similarities between music and photography. There are a lot of, in, in my personal life, I can definitely see how and why it happened. Um, as I said, when I was a kid, I was always spending time outside. I grew up in the city, so the, the nature was sort of this amazing escape that I could experience whenever my parents took me camping. And that, I guess, planted some seed in me that uh, at some point had to grow, at some point had to uh, express itself, and it didn't happen until 20 years later or so. The thing to remember when traveling is that the trail is the thing, not the end of the trail. Travel too fast, and you'll miss all that you are traveling for. And so landscape photography is really hard. It's really, really difficult, um, which is, I guess, one of the reasons why I decided to become a photographer. Because uh, I figured, well, music wasn't hard enough, so let me try something even harder. Um, <laughs> let me really jump off the deep end. But in a sense, um, the whole mindset of, again, having to come up with solutions every day, meaning having to come up with something original and new, was something that I was used to already. So I wasn't afraid of that aspect of it. It was more a question of learning the medium, learning the language of photography, which, which I could understand visually, but of course I needed to understand it um, grammatically, if you will, in terms of uh, try borrowing a, uh, a language metaphor, which means I needed to understand how to put it together. So that's what I'm going to try to talk about today. Now, when I first started shooting, um, I figured, well, let me go out someplace and take a picture. And uh, if I find it, what I think is a really good picture, that'll express what I feel. And of course, uh, my first attempts, or shall I say my first failures of many, um, didn't have really any opinion, didn't have any, any clarity, didn't have, uh, it was really just a snapshot of reality. So I figured, well, maybe I should try a different location. So let me go somewhere else. Um, <laughs> Maybe I'll get better luck somewhere else. And of course, I had the same result. So I started to realize quickly from the beginning that um, it wasn't finding new locations that was the key. It was really what I was bringing to the equation, uh, way of seeing. And it wasn't until I started to see that, to understand that, that then I started to appreciate what it was that I needed uh, to focus on. What I, what, I want, what I needed to capture wasn't the landscape, but it was my interpretation of the landscape. Uh, what I thought of the landscape. And that's the only chance that I figured I would have to, uh, of making something that was meaningful. So I figured, okay, well, if it's not tied to location, then I can really start shooting closer to home. And so I started exploring some of the landscapes in the Hudson Valley. And of course, again, I was met with the same f sort of frustration and failure, which is trying to find uh, the way to express what, how I was reacting to the landscape. So by focusing on things that were familiar and I was passionate about, I could then start to really explore what those things meant to me. And that's when I really started to understand um, that in order to photograph, you're, you have to be intimately familiar with your subject. Okay. The true journey of discovery consists in uh, not in making new landscapes, but in having fresh eyes. Um, a great quote by the novelist Marcel Proust. So I decided to focus on what I was passionate about. And so that led me to my first uh, real insight, which was that the very best photographers that I was admiring, that I was looking at, were interpreting familiar landscapes. They weren't um, necessarily just shooting landscapes to show what they, where they were, but they were using their own personality their own personalities in the landscapes that they were, that they were shooting. And that was coming through the <coughs> pictures. And I could see that because whenever I saw a different picture from a different photographer, I could fairly quickly recognize uh, who had made the image. So again, I decided to go back to some of my familiar landscapes. This is up in Acadia. Um, but now I had a different perspective. So now I was thinking about the subject, thinking about what it was that interested me. But again, I didn't have all the elements together. And so I started to develop uh, not on my own, but through research, through reading, through studying, um, this thing that we call vision, which is basically how to put all the different elements together 
in a photograph so that then you start to evoke something that the viewer um, can sort of derive from what you're, you're, uh, you're, you're showing them. Okay, so that was the really the first breakthrough that I had, which was putting the elements together. And some of these elements you see here, light, color, composition, et cetera, et cetera. So I started to <coughs> come back again closer to home. This is uh, in the Hudson Valley. And second insight was that I didn't really want to make landscapes of uh, photographs of familiar landscapes. I wanted to share what it was that I was experiencing and that I thought many others were taking for granted because this was, again, close to home, close to where I lived. And I wanted to try to find a different way of expressing, of showing things so that people could really appreciate the things that I was appreciating. Um, so to be successful at that, I realized that, that there's two things that I needed to do. One was I needed to make images that were based on reality but not of reality. And what I mean by that is that I needed to interpret the images. Um, I didn't want to make images that were that people could see for themselves. I wanted to make images that uh, were interpreted through what I found interesting about them. So uh, whether I was expressing serenity and beauty in an image like this, okay, or whether I was expressing, um, for example, a path or a journey, I started to understand this language that I needed to learn. And this language had to do with things like composition, with light, uh, with form, uh, with color, with mood and drama, and especially with allegory. And allegory is a thing that I'll come back to in the future, which is this idea of uh, showing symbols in photographs that will represent other things, something that um, painters did very well. So again, maybe I was expressing the passage of time or impermanence, for example, okay, through the use of long exposures. This is in Nova Scotia. And so I, I'm trying to, again, come, away, c come across in my images with what I was experiencing personally when I was there. Or maybe expressing uh, an opinion about just the drama of a place. So an opinion really became the key thing for me. What is it that I think about nature? How do I react to it? How can I convey that to other people? And so you don't necessarily need an iconic location. I mean, that's one of the things that I constantly hear from photographers. We need to travel to this special place. And yet, um, the special place is really inside of you if you, you're willing to go in and, again, ask those questions, why it is that you're doing what you're doing. Um, I would rather try to reveal the extraordinary and, and things that are places that are mundane versus make extraordinary pictures of places that were pretty iconic or, or, or regular. because. Again, those are relatively known, and I wanted to try to explore things that were more personal for me. Sometimes you may uh, be wanting to uh, convey how you feel. Uh, this particular picture for me is one I'll never forget because it was a day that I was feeling rather uh, sad and depressed about some, some deep family issues. And so walking through the woods, I found this picture, and it was something that made me feel better about um, that particular moment, even though I was not feeling that great. And again, I tried to bring that across through the image. So it comes down to your intent, to your aims. Uh, to make great images, you need to start with an opinion, an opinion about what your subject is. Without that opinion, it's really hard to share that with anyone else. And other people, I think, s can sort of see that in your images if you don't have a strong sense of, of what the image is about. Now. Of course, I looked at a lot of phot uh, photographers. I looked at a lot of photography. I studied as much as I could. Um, and that was all great. But I wanted to go further. I wanted to go beyond that and try to find other inspiration in different places. And living in the Hudson Valley, one of the things that I sort of stumbled across was the Hudson River School of Painters, uh, who used a lot of the landscapes in the area as inspiration. And they were also masters at communicating things visually. And that was what interested me the most. Not in emulating painting, okay, not in emulating a, a, a painting, but in figuring out how they were using the visual language to communicate their ideas and their story. And that's something that I felt I could use that and borrow that and use it in photography. Uh, this is a famous painting by Thomas Cole, The Oxbow. And you can see, again, this great juxtaposition between the left side and the right side, between uh, between sort of dark moody side and the bright side on the right side. This represents sort of this clash between uh, wilderness and, um, and, uh, and us taming the wild. And these are the issues that they were dealing with at the time. This is a great uh, one by Albert uh, 
Bierstadt. This is the Sierra Nevada mountains. And if you look at these pictures, you can see this masterful work of light and color and drama. And they really understood this really well. And so this is way before photography. And this is, again, just something that we can draw from in terms of ideas, inspiration, etc. Asher Duran, this is another uh, great image. And a lot of these paintings are really, really big. And when you see them big, you really are drawn into the image. And that's something that, again, was so impressive for me uh, that I wanted to figure out what it was about. Because again, it, we're just talking about a visual language here. These are scenes in nature, landscapes, the kind of things that I'm photographing day in and day out. And they were going to these places as well and, and interpreting them. And one more, Albert Burstad, another one from uh, Yosemite Valley. Uh, and again, just really great um, use of allegory, especially. Uh, how they're able to take what looks like a very complicated painting, but make a very simple message behind it. And that's something that all of us can use when we're doing, when you're out shooting landscapes. Uh, if anyone is interested in exploring more, there's an amazing iPad app called Art Authority. Um, and there's also a companion Mac app. But anyway, this app, um, Basically, it's a virtual museum, and it gives you paintings from all generations, from all eras, from all different artists. Uh, and it's a great way to kind of just discover and explore if you're, if you're into that kind of thing and you like uh, painting. Uh, it's, been a, it's been great for me just to sort of uh, uh, randomly look through images and, and get ideas about whether it's color or composition or form or light or et cetera. There's a lot, a lot to learn there, and we should be drawing from, uh, from this rich history that we have in terms of the arts. So what is this language, this visual language, and, and how do we learn it? Um, through my own experience, and of course from studying, I've, I've, I've realized that there are some key essential elements that I've discovered that I, that I use. And again, discovered meaning I'm, I'm borrowing from lots of others that have come before me. Um, and the ones that I think are the most important are moment or mood, pre-visualizing or visualizing, depending on where you are. Some people prefer the term visualizing. I think if you're in the field, you're actually visualizing because you're there. Um, pre-visualizing would imply that you're not there and you're kind of thinking about the image in your head. But either way, uh, color, uh, composition, and light. And I have light in yellow because I think of all those five, I think light is the key one. That's the key ingredient that really um, needs to be in place for the others to work really, really well. All of these help to eliminate postcard type images, the ones that we see very, very often. And again, we're getting away from images that on the surface just show you, uh, show you a place. Uh, we're talking about images that evoke some feeling or tell you more about the photographer than it does about the actual place itself. So a couple of examples here in my own work. This is combining light and mood and some pre-visualization because this is a place that I've been to many, many, many times and I know exactly where I would go if I wanted to take a picture of it. So I had in my head what kind of composition I would make, but of course uh, the moment and the mood was something that I couldn't predict and I, I, I got lucky uh, this particular day. This is in the Shawangunk Ridge, about 90 minutes north of here. Using color and composition to create tension and mood. Um, and that's always very effective. And there's a very subtle difference between the foreground and the background in terms of color, and that creates this tension between blues and, and, and warm reds and oranges. Light and a very specific and dramatic moment. All right, and again, I'm talking about these elements. The more these elements you can combine, the stronger your image has a potential of being, especially if you can get really strong light in there. Light really is kind of the glue that holds everything together and allows you to sort of move beyond what you're seeing and into an area of getting people to react and feel something and want to return to an image over and over again. So craft and technical mastery, um, those things are really important, but they don't necessarily communicate what the photographer's feeling. So no matter how advanced the technology gets these days, no matter how automatic the cameras are, no matter what, amazing capabilities they give us, ISO 3 billion, um, the one challenge they still can't solve is that of composition and that of what's behind the camera. As there used to be a quote here before, the most important part of the camera is the 12 inches behind it. All right, and so again, that, that perfectly illustrates what I'm saying, which is the technology is great, but still being able to use it in a way that's 
uh, effective is the key. So using composition and light, okay, uh, again, light is the key that makes this image. You take the light away and I step over this and don't even notice it. Mood, composition, and light, again, combining these different elements together. This is in the Smoky Mountains. Composition, light, and visualizing. This is up in Nova Scotia again. Uh, this is one of those images where I walked this beach for an hour, an hour and a half maybe, trying to find the perfect image. And meanwhile, I realized that the image was happening before me. I just needed to sort of stop and wait for these things to come into play. And so that's where the visualization comes in. If I can visualize how this, how this would work if I got the surf in a certain area, in a certain angle with the clouds in, in place, then I can sort of convey what, how it is that I'm feeling right here, right now, and what, how this is all changing and happening. Um, so again, uh, visualizing there. Composition, light, and also visualizing. Um, water was falling into this small area, and every time it fell, it would make ripples. Uh, or I should say wind, actually. Wind was blowing across the surface of this, this little stream. Okay, so, and of course, using light and color. Here, of course, drama, a lot of drama. Light, color, composition, visualization, all those things are in place. Um, through a lot of practice, of course. This is not just, you know, you just walk up, into, uh, up to a scene and, the, and, and there it is, so. So again, those elements that I talked about before, these are all the elements that I'm trying to, fi I'm trying to use here effectively. Now, these, all these essential qualities really define what I, what I look for in a photograph, what, I, what I'm trying to find in terms of putting an image together. They convey, they help to convey how I feel about nature, my passion for sharing something that I find worth getting up every day for. That's my personal approach. That's the kind of thing that gets me up. That's the thing that gets me to go out when it snows 12 inches because I want to go out and see what this landscape looks like. Um, and many of these are, are, many of these ideas, meaning getting beyond the small details but looking at the overall picture is something that I've been think, studying recently uh, which is called a gestalt theory which says that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. We've heard that, that, that before in advertising, but that when you look beyond just the individual parts and it becomes something more than what it is, symbology, allegory. So that led me to the third insight, which the third insight is that in order to make all these elements work together, they need to be as simple as possible. And that really, what, that really gets to the heart of any message, which is the simpler you make a message, the easier it is for the person who's receiving it to understand it. And the simplest way of conveying something is usually the most effective. And it's also very synonymous with beauty. Things that we see as beautiful are often things that we see as simple, and vice versa. So whether it's um, framing using musical ideas. As a musician, I borrow a lot of ideas in music. I use a lot of ideas in music when I'm out taking pictures, when I'm out photographing. I look for rhythm, ways that keep the eye moving through an image in a, rhythmic, in a rhythmic pattern, but one that is pleasing. <laughs> because that's something that I used to work at in music over and over again. You know, there's, there's great music and there's not so great music. What makes great music is the same thing we can use here. Light and rhythm, leading the eye and creating just a, a, enough subtle tension. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very subtle relationship between the trees that are perfectly straight and the ones that are curved. Because there's only two that are curved, the one on the far right and the one on the left. And again, this is, a lot of it is adapting and to changing situation. I didn't, I didn't imagine this in my head. I was walking through the woods and there were these trees and I tried to find a way to make them more interesting than just trees standing in a field. And again, by practicing these ideas of um, the, using the elements together, um, it's helped me to improve in, in what I'm trying to do. Simplicity is about subtracting the obvious and adding the meaningful. This is one of my favorite quotes because that really is what simplicity is all about. It's um, just enough to make the image meaningful and no more. Uh, or as Confucius would say, life is really simple, but we insist on making it complicated. Um, which, you know, that's something that we do on a regular basis, I guess. It's just human nature, I suppose. Now, one of the interesting things is that painters, 
move from a blank canvas, so they're starting with absolute simplicity or, or the best simplicity and they add things to it. Landscape photographers actually start in the opposite direction and specifically landscape photographers because um, we are faced with so much chaos all the time and so subtracting things is really, really critical and we, we have to go in reverse and, and the, the, I guess the, one of the key things is knowing when to stop so that you haven't subtracted so much that you've removed what is that's meaningful. That's why that quote before is, is to me so uh, important. Uh, subtract what you don't need, keep what's meaningful. Every element in an image in a frame needs to serve a purpose. There should not be anything in your image that d act doesn't actually serve a purpose, whether that purpose be um, reinforcing the subject, reinforcing an idea, um, whether it's negative space, whether it's uh, something that balances something else in the image in terms of visual weight. All right, everything needs to have a place. And what doesn't add detracts. That's another thing that I kind of repeat to my students in workshops every single day, 10 times a day until they can't stand it anymore. But it's, if it doesn't add, it's taking away. And so figure out a way to get rid of that so that you're only left with what is adding to the image. Now, one of the things that is interesting about simplicity that I am understanding more and more, and I think it's useful to share, is that simplicity doesn't necessarily mean a lack of complexity. It uh, doesn't mean that an image should, be, should lack complexity. What it means is that it should be simple in its message and it should have control over the medium. So as a musical example, for instance, uh, we all know, we, I think we would all agree that Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is, or I should say, Mary Had a Little Lamb is much simpler than Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, but we would never confuse one with the other in terms of which is a greater piece of work. And that's because Beethoven knew exactly what to do with the complexity to make it simple. And all great artists do that. And I think that's a, a really important thing to realize is that simplicity is beauty, but that doesn't necessarily mean simple in terms of the, the art form. We can make it complex. It just needs to be simple in what the message is. So here's an example of an image in terms of it may seem to be somewhat simple, but in terms of my eye, my mind's eye, how I broke it down, how I kind of placed these elements in space, in my frame, through my viewfinder when I made the image. So this is kind of how I saw the image to start, in terms of where I'm going to place my camera, where I'm going to put my, my lens, so that I get all the shapes and, uh, uh, and all the different spaces in place. And so for instance, number one, which is the subject, that's the big rock on top, balances with number two, the bottom left. And then three, four, and five sort of create a way of balancing out those two areas. And you're left with the final result. And that is a way for me that I try to find a visual design in, in the pictures and in a way that they don't feel like they're imbalanced in some way or another. Whether that imbalance could be uh, between too much uh, shadow, too much highlight, whether it's balanced too much to the left, too much to the right, whether it's too complex on one side or the other. Any and all ways that an image can be made to feel imbalanced without being uh, purposely done that way, and that's a whole different story. Again, that's more the idea of having control over the medium so that you can make an image that's in balance but still works. That's, of course, what we all strive to do. Now, improvising in the field is one of those things that is also very valuable, especially in landscapes, because we're at the mercy of pretty much everything. Assuming that you know what your camera is going to do, everything else you don't. Uh, you don't know what the weather's going to do, you don't know what anything's going to do. So, as a, when I studied jazz in school, that's one of the great things that I learned, which is to kind of be on my toes all the time. This is a perfect example because this was the image that I wanted to make. This was the image that in my heart I had that I, that I wanted to make, and yet it wasn't the image that I wound up with. Watch very carefully. That's the part of the image that actually attracted me that I thought was stronger, that I thought was more interesting. And this isn't a crop. Okay, I reframe, meaning I change lenses, put a long lens on, and compose that image by itself. So. That's the image that I wound up with, but being able to find that and to adapt to that in the field was, I think, key for me to make that image. Now, of course, you can crop. There's no reason why you can't crop. For me, I can't crop because, as I mentioned at the beginning, I sell most of my work as fine art, and so if I'm cropping my images this much, I can only make a print this size. <laughs> you know, so I need to keep the resolution in my images as high as possible. So I want to capture images in the field uh, without having to crop. And the other thing about cropping, um, in terms of just the, the 
the approach to photography is that if you're cropping, then you're not seeing that in the field. And I think you're always going to be a better photographer when you can identify the images in your eye through your viewfinder before you crop. I'm not saying cropping is bad. What I'm saying is that the stronger you uh, develop your sense of vision, the more enjoyable the photography will be and the more images you'll make, the more images you'll find versus having to accidentally come across them because you're cropping. Sometimes, of course, technical issues you have to crop. But in this case, as I said, I saw something that I thought could make a strong image far away. And as soon as I put the different lens on and looked at the viewfinder, there was the image without all the other chaos around it. Then it all became clear to me. Again, using simplicity. This is another one of those images where I just extracted what Ansel would say, extract versus abstract, because he liked this idea of we're extracting just a piece of the landscape out of what our whole field of vision sees, uh, and making it as simple as possible. Same thing again. Um, simple in the sense of what the image conveys. It might seem complicated, but there's very s just very simple lines and very simple shapes. Again, trying to keep the idea is as simple as possible. One single color, simple shapes, repeating patterns. And those things tend to allow the viewer to sort of see, hopefully, more than what the image necessarily shows right up front. Sometimes I use long exposures to remove uh, distracting elements. For example, water. If I don't want waves, I want water to be very smooth and natural, uh, very smooth and sort of almost like glass. Same thing with clouds. And in this image in Nova Scotia with a very long exposure, um, it's making the image simpler in a sense and giving it s uh, a different element that is what I felt when I was there, but I couldn't quite capture it without using a long exposure. And uh, believe me, I tried. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the, we all experience a scene through all our senses. We have, you know, touch, feel, hearing, etc. Camera only sees the visual, and so the key is to really try to figure out how to take those other senses that we are not including in the image, and and s try to bring them across. Joe Cornish, one of my favorite uh, British photographers, says, "If we feel light, and I think the word feel is the key phrase, the key word in this whole quote, our picture will touch hearts and have an emotional impact." Light is the doorway to emotion, and the landscape photographer must learn the combination that unlocks it. So the fourth insight that I had was that nothing is more important than light. Or if that seems obvious to you, because we are photographers, then nothing is more important than feeling light. And there's a huge difference between just seeing light and feeling light. Because when you feel light, then you're working with it, as Jay Mizell says, as a subject. Um, and I tr always try to photograph light as a subject, not something that's that is an addition to the, Im to, the, to the scene or to the landscape, but it's actually the thing that I'm focused on. And when you focus on light, of course, you cannot focus on light by itself. You have to focus on light in terms of what it's doing to the landscape, the highlights, the shadows, the atmospherics, whatever it is that it's creating. But if you focus on it as a subject, then I think it leads you to create images that are much more um, evocative, if you will. So it helps to, to, you know, light helps to focus our attention on things that uh, seem, that could, could, you know, can seem mundane, as I mentioned before, express our feelings about nature. Uh, it, can create it can create highlights and shadows, uh, which are key. Highlights and shadows, shadows being just as important as the highlights. They both work in tandem. Sometimes mystery can be used um, in an image. What is an image about really what is it? Uh, what is it trying to convey or portray? Um, another way of thinking about that is that if you can make images that ask questions, uh, those those images usually will be much more remembered and more appreciated than those that simply uh, give answers. Because when they ask questions, then of course everyone's um, everyone has the ability to provide their own answer. And if that happens, then again, that's something that uh, goes beyond just an image that really doesn't give that, that option to the viewer. So asking questions, whether the questions are, where was the photographer when he, when he made the image? What was he thinking about? Uh, what's, what's really the image trying to say? What's the, what's the, what's the 
the the real nature of 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 the of the idea. Again, using light as a subject. Of course, the subject is not the light necessarily. For me, it was because it was the light that drew me to make the composition that I made. And of course, everything else just becomes a function of what the light is doing. Again, light. Uh, I was almost ready to walk away from this spot until the light came up. And I wasn't really quite sure that the light was going to line up exactly the way it did, but it, it, but it did. Had it not, then I probably would have made a different image, a different composition, etc. Would it have been effective or not? I don't know. But uh, thinking about light first was the key. The fifth insight that I had, or am still having, <laughs> is that failure is an opportunity because there are lots of failures. Um, it seems like there's more failure than anything else. Bill Cosby said, in order to succeed, your desire for success should be greater than your fear of failure. Uh, and that's one that I've tried to uh, carry with me because um, sometimes I don't feel like I want to keep going because the failure can be, can be frustrating at times. And of course, Mr. Einstein said, a person who never made a mistake never tried anything new. And if you have that inspiration, if you have that motivation to continue to try to make new things, then you can get past the failures. Now, as I mentioned before, I failed a lot. Um, whether it was lack of a subject, lack of a clear subject matter, or whether it was poor composition, whether it was um, sort of not using light properly, or whether it was lack of focus, uh, not knowing how to use my camera properly. I've, I've, I've failed a lot. Matter of fact, I made this. Um, <laughs> and this is just a fraction uh, of my failures. But it, it, it means to me that even though I failed, I can continue to move forward because there are always the bright spots. There are always the bright moments. There are always the breakthroughs. And those are the ones that really make every single um, effort worth it. So the sixth insight is that time and practice are really essential to success. Time and practice. Um, if you're waiting for the perfect time, for the perfect weather, for the perfect season, if you're waiting for whatever it is that you think is going to give you the best conditions to get out and make pictures, then you're not really making a habit of getting lucky. And I'm going to talk about luck a little bit later. Um, you know, that really isn't the, 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 the goal. However, there are certain skills that we need in order to be able to take advantage of this luck. Uh, Twyla Tharp, who is a great choreographer and a creative person, said, if art is the bridge between what you see in your mind and what the world sees, then skill is how you build that bridge. And I love that, uh, that quote. So, so practice is key, um, which is why familiar landscapes are so valuable, which is why I always promote shooting things that are close to home, things that you can get to easily, because it allows you to practice these concepts over and over and over again um, and really get at the essence of what good pictures are about. Knowledge is great, but practical knowledge is even better. So in the book, I go over about 10 things that I feel are really good investments. And I use the word investments because some of these things are things you can buy, but investment is a better term because an investment means that you're investing into something that's going to give you a return over time. And to me, that's much more important than something that just gives you a quick fix. So first thing is, Learn your gear inside out. Um, master the tools so they become an extension of your mind. Now, this might be easier said than done, of course, but it's really critical that if you don't know what the gear can and can't do and understand how to take advantage of that, then it's going to be hard to even think about any of the stuff that I've spoken about before because you're going to be stuck in this stage. Um, and it's so hard to do that when we're buying new stuff all the time. At least I would like to be buying new stuff all the time, but I'm not. Um, but that's a key thing. So really have to focus on learning the gear inside. That's something that I really worked on at the beginning to the point where um, the gear that I have, I mean, I can, I can pretty much put a lens on and turn it to the right focal length before I even know what, before I even put the camera to my eye because I know what the field of view is going to be. And that's because I've practiced and shot and used that so many times. I can reach into my bag and grab a lens without even looking at it and knowing exactly what the lens is. I don't have that many lenses, but, <laughs> but nonetheless, I know, OK, this is a scene. That's the lens I need for that. This is a scene. That's the lens I need for that. This is the composition I want. That's what I need to do. And that just comes from practice. But once you get there, 
boy, that opens up a whole new world because now you're not thinking about that anymore. And of course, our brains are limited and we're dysfunctional. We're always in the field thinking about lots of different things, looking at lots of different things. Second thing is learn the fundamentals of photography. And I haven't tried to teach you that here because that's uh, widely available anywhere. If you want to email me, I can give you a huge list of books, websites, video tutorials, galleries, museums, all kinds of stuff. But the fundamentals of photography, learn um, the fundamentals of aperture, shutter speed, uh, depth of field, learn basic compositional elements like lines and shapes and horizontals and diagonals. Those are basic things that any good photography book can teach you. But again, I've, I have some books that are, the pages are falling out because I keep reading it over and over and over again. Yes, I understand that. I'm going to read it again. Because I don't want to understand that. I want it to become second nature, ingrained. Like the way I'm speaking English right now. I'm not thinking about the words. When I went to France two weeks ago and I had to speak French, it was a disaster. <laughs> because I was thinking about every single thing. And that's when I realized, wow, how cr important it is to know a language whether that be a visual language or a spoken language, so that you don't have to think about it. And that's really critical for any photographer, especially landscape photography. Um, one quick quote, Twyla Tharp says, in order, to have, in order to think outside the box, you have to start with a box. And so that's where the fundamentals begin. L learn your rule of thirds inside out, and then you can break all the rules you want. Number three, a couple of practical things. Quality tripod. Um, lenses, lenses and filters in a backpack. Notice I didn't mention camera bodies because lenses are always more valuable than camera bodies. You're going to get more quality, more, um, more long-term benefit out of a lens than you will out of a body. Um, and so I always try to make sure that students are realizing that when you're sp spending your money and looking at what to invest in, make sure that you're really matching up your lenses to get the best, the optics. I mean, you're taking pictures. The optics is what's going to capture the scene. Okay, quality tripod, obviously, so many students show up with tripods that they think they've saved money on or got a good deal on. I hear stories all the time. Um, I bought my, I'm partial to Manfrotto, but Manfrotto or Gitzo, I bought mine eight years ago. It's been a walking stick, it's been a weapon, it's been, um, <laughs> it's been a crutch in the ice, it's been everything, and it still works, it's still functioning. Um, it's a carbon fiber, the best I could buy at the time. My wife almost killed me, but now, it's, it's like a friend. Um, and a good backpack. If you're not comfortable in the field, I'm a huge advocate of, of comfort in the field. Not because I don't like to suffer. Believe me, I suffer plenty when you're out there hiking and enduring, whether it's heat or cold or what have you. But if you're comfortable with your stuff, not only comfortable with your backpack, but being able to get stuff out of your backpack. As I said, in nature, you never know what's going to happen. And once I struggle with the zipper once, and I lose a picture because I can't get it open, that's it. Gar bag is in the garbage because it should be something that's functional, that helps and aids you. Um, and I'll talk about what I recommend later. Quality apparel, again, if you're not comfortable in the field, doing, again, nature photography, good boots, good outerwear, base layers, rain gear. Um, I buy the best up front, and it lasts me forever. Like, my wife loves me because I never buy clothes. Because the stuff that I bought 10 years ago just lasts. If you pay 100 bucks for that Patagonia under, uh, you know, base layer, it'll last a long time. So these are just kind of the things that I notice that have really played a, a, a difference for me, just in some practical things. Now, on to some things that are less practical, but I think much more important is inspiration and education. And this is something that I am daily um, working on, which is learning as much as I can about everything uh, having to do with what I, I'm trying to do in my, in my art. And it's not just photography, it's everything. Everything that you put into taking a picture is a function of who you are as a person. If you're a happy, un, uh, disgruntled person, that's probably going to come across in your pictures. If you're a happy, positive person, that's probably going to come across as well. So reading lots of books, looking at other art, photography and non-photography, uh, working on projects, because projects make you focus. They make you focus on a very specific sort of idea and that keeps you from straying onto different things and different uh, just sort of going out randomly and shooting which that's fun for a little while but then after a while you sort of lose focus, focus and it's hard to measure your progress as well when you're kind of shooting randomly that way and of course workshops is another great way um, not necessarily because I teach workshops but because I see it all the time I can't tell you how many times I get students that come in a five-day workshop 
And after the five days, not only are they much more confident about their work, but their work has improved because they've spent literally almost 24 hours a day for five days in a row thinking about nothing but their photography. And that really, that focused and very concentrated uh, attention to one thing really makes a huge difference versus, you know, even myself now when I get, I only get up, go out and shoot, you know, a couple of times a week at best if I have a good week. If you're so inclined, printing your work is another useful way to improve your work. It helps to refine your vision because when you're seeing your work in printed form, there's something about seeing it that is different from seeing it on a computer screen. It puts it into the real physical world, something that, uh, that we sort of have more, uh, more, uh, more of a reaction to, I would say. Uh, it gives you better appreciation of your work, whether it's good or bad, either way. If, if it's not that good, you'll know it even more so. And if it's good, you'll know it even more so. Um, it's a physical object you can hold. And I think it makes what you're doing more tangible. And I think we're so, so, so often we're out in the field and we're taking pictures and everything is so sort of ephemeral. We don't really know what, what it is, especially now with digital. I mean, even with film, we had something that we pulled out of the camera, a film row. Now it's, it's zeros and ones. So when you print, it really is something that you can... Uh, you're creating something, something that's real, and, I, and to me, that's had a, a huge impact on, uh, on 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 what I do. Physical health and mindfulness. These are two big topics that I teach whole workshops on uh, on mindfulness up at Omega, the Omega Institute, and it it is nothing to do with religion or anything like that. It's really a function of being where you are when you are when you're there. You know, it's like uh, wherever you go, there you are. It's that phrase. And so um, I find that when you're not distracted, when you can focus on what's happening in front of you instead of what you would like to happen, to me, I find that that's a great way to get lucky. <laughs> I always get lucky when I pay attention to what's actually happening. Um, gear has very little, in the, in, in, little bearing on whether an image is successful or not. What has the most success is your attentiveness to what's going on, especially, again, as, as I said, if you're doing landscapes because things change in an instant, in a second. And as, and as far as physical health, doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter what condition you're in, I just mean trying to stay as healthy as possible because uh, it just makes, again, the act that much more enjoyable. I go out with 20 year olds, 30 year olds, 70 year olds, 80 year olds, and they just seem so happy because they can get out there and experience that. And um, I just think that when your mind is clear, there's a strong connection and lots of research between the mind and the body. When your mind is clear because you feel good, then you can be more creative, I believe. And finally, time and luck. That's the last best investment, in, and especially time. That's probably the best investment that you could ever make, being out there, spending lots of time out there. Um, as for luck, there's two definitions that I like. One is, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity, by the great philosopher Seneca. And Waldo Emerson said, good luck is another name for tenacity of purpose. And if it's one thing, I'm tenacious because I just keep at it. And I think I'm nuts for keeping at it, but I just keep doing it because I just feel that the more you do it, the better chance you have of getting lucky. And it, 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 it does, in fact, work. So a little bit about what I'm using so that just to talk a little bit about technical. Um, I've used different cameras over the years, but this is my main set. This, this, when I look at this picture right here, uh, it strikes a chord emotionally with me. Why? Because this is what I've been, this is what I've had in my bag, on my body for the last six, seven years, constantly. So it's like, it's like my friend. This is a Canon 1 DS Mark III with a 1740 lens. Next to it is a 70 to 200 2.8 uh, lens. And next to that is a 24-105 uh, Canon lens. All our lenses, all weather sealed. Um, and then I use a polarizer and uh, a couple of Lee ND grads. What I left out of this picture was I also have a couple of just regular ND filters that I put on the camera t for long exposures. And for some reason I couldn't find them. I think my son took them. Because um, <laughs> he's also taking pictures. That's another story. But, um, but this is my main, my main kit. And I know this camera inside out. I can, I can as a matter of fact, I, I actually have shot this camera without the LCD working. Uh, I went out one time to do a project for uh, Cena Cuts In, and lo and behold, I thought the camera was dead because the LCD wasn't giving me any readout after I took a picture. But when I hit the um, 
I forget exactly how I could tell that it was working. Well, actually, I didn't know. I would hit the shutter button, and I would get, I would get a click that it took a picture, but I wouldn't get a readout. I hit the play button, couldn't see anything. And I needed to do the job that I was, you know, I, I had traveled an hour. So I just kept taking pictures. And I just went on the, you know, just instinct, making sure I had the right uh, exposure setting. The exposure meter was reading, was working, I'm sorry. Um, and when I got home, all the pictures were there. So that actually taught me, gave me a really great idea because now when students come on my workshops, on one day I have every student tape a, an index card over the back of their camera and go out and take pictures for an hour. Okay, and you'd be surprised at how people run around like they've lost their sense of balance because they can't look at their camera to see whether the picture worked or not. And I'm saying, no, no, the only way to tell if a picture worked is what you see with your eye, what, what, what it looks like through the viewfinder. Okay, you may mess up the exposures, but I'm not concerned about exposure. I'm concerned about composition. I'm concerned about capturing the essence of what you're seeing. Exposure, you can learn that fairly easily. The other part is a lot more difficult. So, um, so just a little bit about that. Wide angle lenses, of course, expand a landscape. So I love wide angle lenses because they distort reality in a sense. They make foreground objects appear a lot bigger than they really are, and they push the background back. So they create a lot of space and a lot of depth. And for landscapes, for making prints, you want that depth because that makes your prints, that makes what is in effect a two-dimensional image when you're done, feel and look more like a three-dimensional image. And a long lens, like the 70 to 200, has the opposite effect. It compresses the landscape and it also reduces depth of field. Now, a wide angle lens gives you more depth of field. Now, I know that, technically speaking, that isn't necessarily correct because depth of field really only uh, is affected by the size of your subject matter. However, in practical terms, when you're shooting a landscape, if you're standing on the edge of an ocean, you cannot move forward, and you cannot move back necessarily. If you're standing on the edge of a cliff, you cannot move forward or back. If you're standing in a, in, a, in a spot where you can't move, then that's why I say that your, your focal length will affect your depth of field because you're not able to move back and forth, which is not the case, let's say, if you're shooting a portrait or whatever. Um, and I love using long lens, especially in the 70-200, because, again, it compresses and it creates more of a flatter effect, a tapestry, if you will. It allows you to create very, very interesting layers. And the more you understand that, as I mentioned before, the more you're able to see something in front of you, Think, visualize what it's going to look like in an image, and then you can use the tool that it's going to allow you to achieve that. And when the sun is rising or setting, the light is changing, the fog is drifting away, the last thing you need is to be fumbling with your gear and figuring out what lens you should use. Um, I use Guru Gear backpacks, uh, which I think are the best on the market. Uh, uh, B&H has them here. Uh, and I use, as I mentioned before, Manfrotto carbon fiber tripod with a BH3 ball head by Kirk Enterprises. I've had it for years. As I said, it's been underwater, above water. It's been everywhere, and it still works great. It's an investment I made, and, and uh, I don't see myself getting a new one anytime soon. And again, the bag is very comfortable, very easy to get stuff in and out of. Um, so that's pretty much it. I mean, I throw that on my back, that's, that's, and that's, I'm out the door. As far as printing, I've given lots of talks here on printing. Uh, I use Canon and Epson printers. I'm a Canson Infinity ambassador, which means that I help uh, Canson Infinity with product development and promoting their papers and coming up with different ideas. Canson is a paper company based in France. Um, and my, I mentioned before that I have a book coming out next week, so I just wanted to mention that real quick, a digital fine art printing guide, um, which will be available um, in ebook form. This picture here is one that is especially um, um, especially important for me because it's a picture that I probably I, I, I probably couldn't have made when I first started shooting because it involved a lot of the things that I talked about, whether it was being in, in, in decent physical condition to get to the spot. Waiting, for, waiting and being present for things to happen because, again, I, you, you constantly want to move somewhere else and you're thinking about what's going on over there, what's going on over there. But uh, I decided to wait and to just kind of wait to see what would happen. And this fog rolled in and out. When I got here, I couldn't see anything at all. It was, just, it was just completely fogged out. But slowly but surely, things changed. And again, being able to identify the feeling that I had and then figure out how to capture that in a black and white image 
was the key. And so a lot of the things that I failed at came together. And when I left here, when I got home, when I finally made the image, it made that huge screen that I showed you before with all the failures l l less important. It made it much less of, a, of, a, of an issue for me. So I can go back now, and this is close to home. This is, I mean, I basically live right here. I mean, this is two miles from my house. Um, I know this spot very, very well. And because I go there over and over again, I can go and kind of sit there and relax and figure out how it is that I want to interpret it and constantly make different interpretations of the same exact scene and I hope, again, show a different character. So whether it's a summer scene like this with a long exposure, whether it's um, a very cold and surreal kind of image, which almost makes it feel like it's not where it was before, uh, whether it's in different kind of light, okay, uh, different rock formations, different, this is high tide, the other one was low tide, or whether it's putting the subject off of the actual landscape and onto what's happening, and happening only in this particular moment in time, because that's, this is not gonna be there, this is constantly changing. Matter of fact, I went back the next day and that chunk of ice was gone, because the tides, et cetera. So again, being familiar allows you to really explore something, whether that something is an idea, whether it's an actual place in a, a landscape, whether it's a feeling that you have, whether it's a project, et cetera. It allows you to focus um, and get your message across. And the whole, I think the whole thing that I want you to take away from this presentation is that it's about what you have to say. And if it's not about what you have to say, then I don't think anyone's interested because there's tons and tons of stuff online about what people, just people, you know, putting images out with no apparent, um, uh, underlying story, but people want to hear what you have to say. This following image is one that took me about two years to make because, again, this is in the Hudson Valley where I live, and boy, after about 10, 12, 14 tries, I was not going to get this done because something was wrong. The conditions, the light, et cetera, et cetera, it just wasn't coming together until finally one day, one morning, it came together. And lo and behold, after I got it, after I made something that I was very happy with, then I started getting luckier because I started going up there more often after that. And so I was able to make a different interpretation of the same, the same place, the same scene, but a different feel. A different one with different conditions and different light and uh, different subject matter. Or again, a, a different one uh, from a different angle. And discovering what it is that I like about this place so much and how to interpret it in a different way. So I just want to leave you with one last slide, and that's my favorite slide, which is a slide of my son, because David Ward said that a childlike sense of wonder is the one factor that links all expressive photography. And Picasso said, every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once he grows up. And I think that's the key thing. Children are infinitely curious about everything. They have a sense of awe and wonder about everything, and we grow up, and somehow that disappears. And when that disappears, I think it takes a lot uh, of the creative juices, if you will, that we all have, I believe we all have, away from us. And so we have to find a way to keep that. And finally, one last quote by the master himself. No man has the right to dictate what other men should perceive, create, or produce, but all should be encouraged to reveal themselves, their per perceptions and emotions, and to build confidence in the creative spirit. So that quote is for all of you to go out there and do what you think is right for you and what makes you happy, because I think that's, a, that's something that we should all be striving to, to do. Find my workshops at my uh, website, robertrodriguezjr.com forward slash workshops. Um, you can also read my blog for um, constant uh, stuff like this. <laughs> uh, and uh, feel free at any time to you know, ask questions or email me about anything you might need, because um, if I can, I will answer your questions. All right, thanks very much. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.